Kubo is an absolute standout film of the year. It's unique, it's fascinating, and it's drenched in the kind of stuff that we love to talk about on this channel. But could it be a sequel? Hey guys, it's Spa Media here, and today I thought I'd talk about a theory that I found the other day there. Is Kubo and the Two Strings a sequel to the tales of Princess Haguya? But before we even talk about this, we need to talk about the original story of the bamboo cutter, the story that Princess Haguya was based on. So in short, there's this bamboo cutter living in the mountains of Japan. One day, he sees a glowing bamboo plant. He decides to investigate it and it turns out that it's actually a bamboo shoot next to the plant. As the bamboo shoot opens, the bamboo cutter sees the most beautiful little girl. She's dressed in regal attire and she's just sitting there inside the bamboo shoot. She seems young and fragile, so he decides to take it home and raise it as his own child. The heavens would provide gold and good harvest for the family, as they cared very much for the little girl. These riches flowed so abundantly that the risk cutter and his wife actually became wealthy enough to be considered nobility. As custom for Japanese nobility, however, the young girl was expected to be married off relatively quickly, but she had no interest in this. She would hide herself away from any suitor. When five of the most eligible men in Japan Japan showed interest. The bamboo cutter himself even brought them to her with a wall separating them. They would all take turns describing the girl as mythical treasures that may not even exist. This was to their folly however, as each man was told by Haguya, present to me these treasures so I know the validity of your statements. The men would leave defeated and years would even pass, but one by one the men would return. The first man presented his treasures and was found to be a liar, for this she did not accept his hand. She sent him away. The second man was also found to be a liar. He had spent his entire wealth creating this fraud and for the same reason he was sent away. The third would never return as he had developed a fear for the sea and could never collect on the treasure he had mentioned. The fourth had promised Buddha's begging bowl and he returns with a begging bowl adorned with gold and jewels but it did not glow with holy light and once again he was turned away. The fifth however had died. He was completely unsuccessful in his attempts but died trying. As time passed, word of Haguya's beauty and talent would travel all through Japan. Word would spread to the emperor of this woman. The emperor sees this chastity as an offering and lays claim to Haguya. She refuses his hand, so he approaches her in her home. Once again, she rejects him. He approaches her physically and in an absolute moment of disgust. She cries out for help to the moon. The moon replies and tells her that she will receive aid. In great sorrow and regret, she realises what she has done. She has asked the moon to remove her from earth. Her and her family put up a fight of course, going as far as the emperor providing imperial guards, hundreds of men within this home trying to protect her from the moon people, but it is too late. The moon emperor has found her. She is forced to leave and adorn a feathered cloak that forces her to forget everything that she has learned of earth, her family, her friends, the beauty of the wilderness. You see in the eyes of the moon emperor, the moon sees no sadness. It sees no grief, and for her body and mind to truly return to the moon, she must leave everything she has from Earth behind. Now both the tales of Princess Haguya and the Bamboo Cutter would have you believe that this is the end of the story, but this theory has another approach. Princess Haguya is taken to the moon. She forgets her life on Earth, but she still feels great sadness from losing her home, but doesn't understand why. She longs to return to the Earth with no understanding, so when the King of the Moon requires his daughters to terminate a brave soldier on Earth, as he had gained great power from holy relics and could become a threat to the heavens. Haguya jumps at the chance. She returns to earth and being there fills her with joy for the first time in many years and when the warrior compliments her on her beauty, she falls in love. Because the moon king had to retrieve his daughter a second time, he becomes adamant and more angry at her. He decides that all moon citizens have to have their eyes removed so they cannot see the beauty of earth and they can't see what earth truly is. A planet that is perfect in its imperfections. Now a component that I've never really seen in this theory, no matter where I've seen it being talked about, is that the bamboo cutter coming from the same cultural roots could actually be based on Shintoism. That would mean that the king of the moon is actually Tsukuyomi. It would mean that the emperor of Japan, as based on Japanese mythology, would be a descendant of Amaterasu and it would bring a whole new layer of depth to the theory. For example, Tsukuyomi and Amaterasu being complete opposites would add a validity to the immediate disgust felt by Haguya towards the Emperor, both being descendants of the two gods, it wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to believe that they are both opposites themselves. It would also explain that the armour that had to be collected by Kubo had such a sun theme to it. The fact that it was golden and adorned with stars and atop the crown was a sun and Amaterasu being the god of 
day and the sun, the holy light, it would explain why the armour was able to protect Kubo from the Moon Kingdom. But if nothing else, if they're both based on Shintoism, it places the two films in a similar universe, if not the same universe. Now is this theory accurate? It breaks my heart to admit it, but no. The fact is, whilst the films share similar roots and pre-industrial Japan, before globalisation. They're very different films. Princess Haguya is a film based around an ancient fairy tale. It's supposed to be a short, isolated story to inspire sensibilities of the time. Much like Snow White in Europe was supposed to teach children not to take food from strangers, Princess Haguya was supposed to inspire the thought of being careful what you wish for and be your own person. Kubo, on the other hand, was supposed to be a love story to Japanese mythology. Through and through, it's a complete given that the backstory was heavily borrowed from the bamboo cutter, but the big stick in the mud is that the Moon Kingdom in Haguya and the bamboo cutter had no investment in Earth. They were completely separate. The Moon Kingdom was content. There was no reason for them to be weaponized. There was no reason for the daughters of the Emperor to be, to be warriors. It's a fun idea and it can't be argued that Kubo feels like a spiritual successor to the story, but I honestly can't say that I believe the theory. But either way, I recommend that in some way that you watch both soon, one after the other, because it really does give food for thought. And if you haven't seen either yet, go and watch them. <laughs> Studio Ghibli has never let me down, and I can honestly recommend anything they've ever made. And Kubo and the Two Strings is a phenomenal film. You will not be disappointed, especially if you like my content because it's a wet dream to somebody like me, you know. If you're a newcomer and you like the stuff about Tsuki Yomi, don't forget to check out my video here. I always appreciate a like and subscribe. And let me know what you thought about the video down below. I always love a bit of feedback, even if it's critical. And I'll see you guys next time.